Lovely. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to Bite Live 2020 and a massive thank you um, before we start for Havas London, who have made today possible. So huge thanks to them. Um, my name is Nicola Kemp and I'm Editorial Director of Creative Brief. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce this session today. We have a brilliant session planned for you on the art and craft of storytelling. And we're so lucky to be joined by two incredible storytellers today, because let's be honest, it is not easy to stay creative in the midst of a global pandemic. And we're going to be honest about that fact. Um, so I'm so grateful that we're going to hear from these two incredibly talented people who will lift the lid on their craft and creativity. So Kate Moss is the author of eight novels and short story collections, including the multi-million selling Languedoc trilogy. Her next novel, The City of Tears, will be published in 2021. She's a champion of women's creativity and the founder director of the Women's Prize for Fiction. Um, the largest annual celebration of women's writing in the world. And she also sits on the executive committee of Women of the World. She was awarded an OBE in 2013 for services to literature and women, and was named Women of the Year for her service to the arts in the Every Woman Awards. And then we have the incredible Vicky Maguire, and she's Chief Creative Officer at Havas London. And she's at the forefront of pushing towards a more inclusive, equal creative industry. In 2016, she became the first ever woman to hold the position of chair of the Creative Circle Awards. And it's lucky for the advertising industry that she was sacked by French Connection and Vivian Westwood before Paul Smith told her to stop drawing and write down her ideas instead. And those ideas have formed the heartbeat of some of the most compelling creative campaigns. Her Staying Alive film for the British Heart Foundation, starring Bingy Jones, has collected over 45 major awards, but most importantly, it saved more than 50 lives. And the Angina monologues, also for the BHF, earned Vicky a coveted British Comedy Award. So thank you both so much um, for joining us today. Thank you. Great so to be here. <laughs> Lovely. So to kick off, um, you know, it, when it comes to writing ads, it would be easy to focus just on what you need to sell and to who. But for anyone who's passionate about their craft, there's so much more to creating compelling and meaningful communication than that. And at a time when we need the power of our creative imaginations more than ever, um, we really want to make this session as interactive as possible. So please do um, put your comments in the chat and the Q&A. We're definitely going to get to those questions. Um, but to kick off, and I did mention it, and when I was reading all your wonderful achievements, I was thinking, I'm not even getting through my email inbox these days. Um, <laughs> so I really wanted to kind of recognize the playing field that we find ourselves in at the moment. Like it's tough um, to be creative, to keep on top of everything, to find the time, and particularly we know all the data about how this crisis has been impacting, um, particularly women, actually, as well. Um, so I really wanted to kick off just to find out sort of how you guys have, have been staying creative and, uh, you know, trying to keep going in the midst of this, this environment. So, Kate, could I kick off with you, please? <laughs> well, it's wonderful to be here, and it's lovely to see you, Vicky, even though we're not in the same room. Uh, uh, yay! <laughs> um, well... <laughs> Because I'm a novelist, um, primarily, um, I spend most of my time on my own in a room with no friends, just imaginary friends to play with. Um, and it's one of the things we're going to talk about later, the, what we all need to be creative. Some people need a lot of people around them and creative bars and interaction and collaboration. And when you write a novel, it's, it's the opposite, oddly. What you need is silence and your own head. So on the one hand, it shouldn't really have been any different for me because I'm sitting where I sit, you know. Um, but what I found was that right at the beginning when it started, that sense of the world being so completely crazy and nobody know what, knowing what was going on and the powerlessness meant that the imaginary world, which is normally my go-to place, wasn't a refuge either. So I became very, very becalmed to start with. Um, I couldn't concentrate on anything. 
And the one thing you need when you're creating a story and plotting and everything is like absolute laser sharp. Okay, if this person does this and this person does that, that's how a story works. But how I got back into it was reading. So sharing other people's imaginations and then walking, you know, the amount of time we're allowed out every day. I, I'm lucky I live in the countryside, so I had fields, not pavements. And slowly I kind of walked myself back into being creative. Mm -hmm. It was a sense of recalibrating the world, not letting the world world, the world of the news, define what I felt. And once I'd stepped away from that 24 hour news cycle, I found that my creative ideas and my characters, they, they could make me here again. It, you know, I'd, I'd drown them out, but then, you know, they started to whisper and then finally they talked. So it took a while, but got back there. I love the insight about getting outside. I think it's a, although I know the irony about talking about that on a Zoom call. But, <laughs> <I'll> Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> but Vicky, what's been your, what's been keeping you creative and how have you kind of adapted to this? I haven't adapted at all. I'm having a horror, I'm having a nightmare, right? And I actually, and I don't mind kind of like putting that out there because, you know, I, I need, I need people. Yeah. I need, I need a buzz. Um, I didn't actually think we'd be locked down for so long. I had a, you know, I would, I'd start doing a new job at Havas. I was like seven or eight weeks in when oh, wow. that happened and I had a, I had a bet with the guys on reception. I bet them a tenner that we'd be back in two weeks. And, and I haven't seen them since. I'm not oh, no. I'll see them for Christmas. Um, if, you know, if not at all. I need, I need people. I need buzz. I need, I need to be in the middle of a distraction, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, I was, I'm stuck in a shitty two-bedroom flat in East London with no outside space. And, and all of my go-tos have gone, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I would go, you know, I sit and I write in cafes. I sit at the back and I listen to people and then I drown them out. I, I feed off other people's energy. You know, if I'm writing, you know, or if I'm kind of creating uh, some, uh, you know, an ad or a piece of comms and I'm talking to a different audience that I don't know, I go and... I go and hang out with that audience, just in a creepy stalkery kind of way. And I can't do any of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so weird because it's taken me back to, it's funny kind of, Kate, what you were saying about your imaginary friends. I've gone into my, I've, I've kind of lived, the only place I can find any space, um, because my flat's too small, my partner who is, uh, He's recently had a kidney and, trans uh, kidney and pancreas transplant, so he's kind of shielding. And he's in the house all the time. And the only time is we only ever meet at the fridge and he's fucking annoying. And it's fair to say, kind of like, we're both getting on each other's tits. Uh, only place I can go is, is into my head, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And I remember as a kid, I'm from a big family in a small house in Leicester. And the, uh, if you were reading in my, in my house, you weren't busy, yeah? So my mum and my dad would find you a job to do. And the only place I could read or get some time to myself was weirdly go and lock myself in the toilet because it, it was the only place with a lock on the door. And I've now taken to kind of like to taking really, really, really long baths and just, just trying to find myself some space within the with the batshit crazy that's going on. And uh, you just have to find any corner and just kind of seek solace there, if that makes, yeah. making yeah. sense. It totally makes sense. And I think it's also that everybody's corner is different, right? Yeah. Some people desperately need people. Some people desperately need to be outside. But I was thinking when you were talking about um, the bathroom that there was genuinely some creative equals research that showed more people had their best ideas in the shower than in the office, no, which, no. <laughs> which I really like in that whole discussion when about sort of where people work um, best. But with, with that um, in mind, I mean, stripping it back to the real basics, I mean, what do you guys think makes a good story? So Kate, <laughs> what for you is that, that uh -huh. where do you start? 
<laughs> well, also, we could launch into the sound of music and start at the beginning, <laughs> uh, you know, but nobody wants me to sing, even at, on a lunchtime. Um, so, well, I think, I think it's everybody listening, all of you will be writers as well because you're creative people. So everybody writes these days in one way or another. But also we're all readers or consumers, however you want to put it. So often we just need to ask what it is for us that makes us engage. So I think what makes a good story is you want to know what happens. You know, you want to, you're going to give your time to this story, this ad, this piece of theatre, this film, but you only keep watching reading because you want to know what happens. So what story is actually being told? Um, I think what makes a good story is a character or characters that you identify with, either in a sense of, oh, that's the worst of me, or, oh my God, I wish I was like that, or I am like that. So some sort of um, identification, the idea of storytelling being a mirror, uh, that we, we seek out our own experiences and deep emotions, and we can see those on the pages of the book, but we also can stand in other people's shoes. So that engagement is really important with the story. Um, I also think there's got to be jeopardy the idea that this might not turn out okay. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's, it's got to be tragic. I mean, that is, it's even harder to achieve in comic uh, writing, I would say. But the idea that this is not settled, so that the telling of the story matters too. So, because if it doesn't, you could just say, this is a story about a woman who goes to sleep, and she sleeps for 100 years, and a guy comes along, kisses her, and she wakes up, and the job is done. That is the story of you know, Sleeping Beauty, but it's all the stuff that gets you to the end that makes you want to hear the story. And I think finally, uh, the story for me is about whether it's a three minute ad, a 30 second bit of advertising, one of my novels, which are big, big books, mm -hmm. um, is the sense that for as long as you're engaged with it, it's the whole world. Yes. So that you're not aware of time passing. As you turn the pages, as you watch the thing on the television, as you see something popping up on your phone, that for the time that it's on, however long that is, it 100% engages your attention. Mm -hmm. And that I think is all any of us can hope for, that for whatever work we do, whatever industry, the creative industries we're in, for the time that people are engaged with us, we become, that piece of work becomes their entire world. Mm. So it's completion. And by the end, you get the full stop. Because in the real world, there is never resolution. But in a piece of art, creativity, whether it's an ad or a novel or a play or a film, there is resolution. And human beings need resolution. Um, and particularly in these difficult times, we need it more than ever. So that full stop matters hugely. Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, interesting point and Vicky I'd, I'd love to get your point your view on this as well when Kate was talking about jeopardy I was thinking yeah there's quite a lot of that commercially right now <laughs> uh, to drive that, that my story. people actually die with swords you know I'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> I, okay I've been in meetings like that <laughs> I honestly that I could not agree more I I mean it's so weird because we come from from off from to opposite ends of the storytelling spectrum, but that that engagements, that's that's the thread that keeps us together, you know. And you know the diff you know, the, the, there are massive differences, and but there are massive similarities. I, as a you know, as a as a creative in an ad agency, have to hold your attention uh, for as long as I can to get my brand's message across. Yeah, so I'm the conduit between the brand and the customer. But unlike when you choose a book or whether you choose to watch something on Netflix or go and see a play, I haven't been invited. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you know, by and large, unless it's, you know, unless it's something I choose to kind of follow on Insta or, or, or you know, physically decide I want a relationship with, I haven't been invited. So I have to not only hold your attention, I have to earn my place. Yeah. And then add to that things like, uh, you know, being able to kind of like opt out of watching ads, um, you know, skippable. Not only have I got to grab your attention, you can now elect not to see the stuff that I do. And then even worse, you 
if you don't want to pay to physically not see the ads, you have to sit through them as a penance for not trading up. So suddenly, at the very worst, advertising has become a tax on the poor. Mm -hmm. So my so God, what we do has to really work hard to be entered, you know, to be entertaining, to actually deliver something, whether it be education or entertainment or new news or knowledge or discounts, whatever. Um, and we've got to earn our rights to be in your, in your home, in the middle of your favorite film, in your feeds. Um, and that is a, that's a massive responsibility, if you like, that a lot of people don't realize. So you have to be entertaining, engaging, um, all of those things for a short amount of time. And then if somebody likes what you've done so much and goes searching for it on Vimeo or YouTube, that's the best. Yeah. Oh my God, they love that. So they're going to have a look and they're going to search it or they're going to send it to their mates. They're going to kind of like pass it on. That is, that's a great feeling because that's when you know you've done your job. But back to the point, you know, Jeopardy or some things that I advertise that I don't really want. I don't want a Jeopardy in my cheese sandwich, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's you know, it's hard enough. Um, but the idea of kind of like finding, finding a thread, finding a commonality, finding a, finding a truth and jumping off that, I think is the basis of every good piece of comms that little grain of truth that you can go and embellish. And that's what I always look for. That's such a, a powerful point. And I love the way you talk with such respect for the audience's time. Because actually, I think that's something that actually is, is, is so integral to creativity is actually like, actually really liking your audience, you know, and being, um, you know, really aware of, of their investment, of whether it's like just an investment of time or whether they're buying your book or your or the product. But um, Kate, you've said before that creators come to things that they make in different ways. And I love Vicky's point earlier about being on the opposite ends of the storytelling spectrum. And that you've said that there's no right way to find your creativity. What, what did you mean by that? What, what was your journey to writing? Well, I think, I mean, I think what Vix and I do, which is so interesting, you know, everything, we think the same about what it means to deliver a message, deliver a story. Um, but her point is absolutely right. But she has a tiny amount of time to deliver that. And I have a much bigger time because with a novel, people can like the look of it, don't get around to it, put it down, pick it up. But there's a much longer relationship because you own it in a different sort of way. There's something physical in your hand or if you're on a read e-reader, it's on your e-reader. Um, what I mean by um, coming to your own creativity, it sounds quite like um, Vix's introduction about, you know, stop drawing and start writing down your ideas, is that we all carry stories within us. We all carry a narrative of our own lives. Uh, we all, when, even if we're not aware of it, when we're walking down the pavement, we are telling a story. You know, this is me walking along the pavement. Hey, look at that woman on the other side. That dog looks a bit ropey. Oh, I'm going to get the bus. Oh, no, it's gone around the corner. Oh, the bus has broken down. No. So we are always narratizing everything all the time, even if it's not conscious. But we all have different ways of interpreting the stories that we want to tell. So some people will sing or need to tell music. They will tell their story that way. Others will paint or draw um, or dance. Um, I use words, Vix use words. Um, many people listening, will, some will feel, yeah, they feel much more in touch with storytelling through visual than they do through words on a, on a page or a screen. And there is no shortcut to that other than when you have a brilliant idea, what do you reach for? Yeah. Do you reach for a pen? I do. Mm. You know, I, I'm, I'm always finding scraps of paper in pockets when I've been out walking in the countryside, you know, little scribble, and, and it will say something ridiculous, you know, utterly banal like cloud and you go well that's that's helpful um, <laughs> that's that's my instinct whereas other people might sing three notes or would you know type a message to themselves on the phone about going to look at something so I think it's it's about being open to the way that ideas approach you not trying to always be in control in the first instance um, letting 
your ideas find you rather than the other way around and letting your mode of expression. And I write plays and I write novels and I write nonfiction. I don't write poetry because that is not my mode of expression. Um, I don't write screenplays because film is not my mode of expression. It's the live theatre that does it for me. So I'm sure that this is, you know, Vix will have a, a different take on this, but I just really believe for everybody who's listening to this, we all tell stories all the time, but we tell them in different ways and just be brave enough to listen to your instinct. That's such good advice. I'd love to bring Vicky in on this because that, that ability to tell stories and particularly within our industry, um, when you joined Havas, which as you said, was right at the start of lockdown, you made I didn't this- realise that. <laughs> <laughs> which is, I mean, that's- that, that That's is a story in itself, itself. isn't it? <laughs> but you, you made this lovely promise um, to creatives everywhere, to the introverts, the extroverts, that you would make a home for them all, which I think is such a powerful point when it comes to actually finding your craft, developing your craft, you know, telling different stories. Yeah. Did, did that, is that what happened? I mean, tell us a bit about that. Did you, did you, are you building that home and how, how is it going? I'm, I'm totally, I'm, I'm totally building that home. Um, because I know from experience that is the best way to get great work out of people, right? Give them, give them what they need to be their most brilliant best. Yeah, and I found that through. I was going to be a fashion designer, right? That was my absolute love. I was going to express myself through fashion, but I was shit. Yeah, and like I think you said in your intro, I got sacked by absolutely everybody. <laughs> um, like, like ridiculously. I mean, there are some places that didn't even take my coat off. Um, I was like, in, I was out. But I was going to be a fashion designer. And it was only until Paul Smith said, we had just stopped trying to draw and write, you know, in, in exasperation because I was putting some shit in front of it, um, that I knew that he said, just pick up a pen. And then suddenly I, I could describe the outfit rather than draw it. Yeah. That was a, that was a massive kind of release for me. Um, and it is, it's kind of how, whatever, what, whatever means you have to do to get that idea out. And, and then when you kind of get into kind of like, you know, whether it be a film or whether it be kind of like writing for, you know, writing for in advertising or writing a novel. And I think it's really telling that I've now got into telling my ideas in the shortest way possible to give the other talented people that I work with, whether it be directors, whether it be art directors, film directors, to give them their chance to tell, to put their craft on top of mine. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's, it's, I mean, that's why it's brilliant kind of like talking to Kate, because I've got so many half started like novels and plays under my bed that I've tried to kind of find my long voice and I can't find it because I'm so ingrained now in getting things down in a very succinct manner to like, I can start, I was like, right, I'm going to write a film. It's going to be brilliant. I can get that down to 30 seconds now and I'm reading it because that's a bit shit. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so I really kind of like, I really envy being able to put a long, put a long tail on a story and follow it through because there is a bit in me now that just chops it off at 60 because I know how much money I've got. But that, that sort of initial thing, you know, of picking up a pen, of starting, definitely, yeah. you know, talking to people around this event, a lot of people at the moment are kind of struggling with the start, you know. Mm. Um, and so, Kate, I'd, I mean, from your perspective, do you always know how a story is going to come together. I mean, do you have that moment, you know, of kind of like, I, I keep seeing this graph on Twitter at the moment that's like, everything goes really, everything's awful, success. You know, that sort of moment, you know, of, of, of overwhelm before everything kind of takes off. Yeah, that sounds like a properly researched graph on Twitter, <laughs> doesn't it really? Um, uh, no, I don't. I, um, it, it kind of absolutely fits, Nikki, with what we were just talking about then. 
is that every writer does it in a different way. But the one thing we all have to do is start. You have to bloody well start. There are many, many, many brilliant ideas and a lot of people have got some great ideas, but it is about the delivery. If you can't get it out of your head and into the format you want it, then it doesn't count. You know, that, that's the thing. And I think what happens with writing, long form writing in particular, is this, that in the world, you know, in Vic's world and, and the world of comms and advertising and the fast pace and the collaboration, people are much better at throwing an idea out, throwing another idea out. People don't take every idea as the holy grail and then are devastated when someone says, oh, I'm not sure that's going to work. What happens in longer form is that for particularly anybody who's listening who might be struggling to start a novel or continue a novel, there is still this odd idea that novels are different from everything else, that they are somehow better than every other form of storytelling. Now, obviously, I'm a novelist. I think they're great. Um, I read a lot of novels. Um, but they're not any different from any other art form. But there is this sense that it must be perfect. Every word that goes down on the page must be perfect. Well, the news is this. I, my first draft of a novel is all emotion. It's me having an idea. It always starts from place. It comes out of a moment in history. And it comes out of, oh, I wonder if this person does that and then she does this and then she does that. What will be, you know. So the first, I do loads and loads and loads of research, years of research before I write one of my historical novels. But when I start my first, yeah, you know, so opposite to Vic, you know, like three years before I sit at my computer. But once I do, that first draft is all emotion. And it's like, okay, let's just get everything out. Doesn't matter how, how rubbish it is, or as Vic would say, how shit it is. <laughs> get it all out. Um, and then once I've got it all down, then I can see what book it is that I'm writing. Whereas what a lot of people do, because they quite understandably want it to be good, yeah. straight yeah. out the blocks, that people write chapter one. And then they rewrite chapter one. And then they rewrite chapter one because it's still not good enough. And the truth is that no piece of art is as good as the one you imagine in your head. Doesn't matter what form we're in, it never will be. So all any of us can do is do our best and get it down. So I then do a second draft and sometimes a third draft. And you know, if I, you know, that's, that's yeah. these are my books. There's 150,000 words in this. This is Vic's entire career at Havas so far. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's, it, it doesn't really, it, it's not about how I do it. It's what works for me and anybody listening. But the only piece of advice is you have to finish. Until you've got a first rough draft, you don't know what you're working with. And that's where I think a lot of writers go wrong, that they're always trying to be creative. Um, Whereas actually sometimes just build your house, then you can paint the walls cool colours. Until you've built the house, you've got no mm -hmm. walls to paint. It's really interesting because there's questions coming in around this. I think like done is better than perfect is a mantra for 2020. Okay. Um, isn't it? That's exactly, I've, I've taken that seriously. I've got so many, uh, that was like, she, that's like cakes in my head. I've got so many chapter ones. It's, and yeah. it's interesting, people are asking, so it, with that in mind, how do you retain that discipline to be creative every day in this, in this sort of times? Is it, is it just carrying on? Is it rather than going back? Because I, I, I'm definitely kind of redrafting and, you know, it sometimes kind of involves almost like a crisis of confidence because you go back to it and you're like, oh, it's, not, it, it's worse than I thought it was. Where do I? So what advice would you give to... Um, people that are saying, how, how do you retain that discipline, not get disheartened? <laughs> well, I mean, I have not above my desk, because as you can see, my desk, there's no above my desk. I'm sitting looking out because I like the trees and birds better than anything else. Um, but I have always in the back of my mind um, a phrase that is attributed to Picasso, um, who at the very end of his life, when he was a, the world's greatest living painter, allegedly, or one of them, at least, um, he was asked by a young artist why he still went to his studio every day. And he answered, when inspiration arrives, I want it to find me working. Yes. And all of us who are lucky enough to be working in the creative arts, however we define it, 
and are therefore doing a job that we genuinely love and are fulfilled by, how, even on the worst days, compared mm -hmm. to a job that is awful and the only job that we're able to do for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Firstly, we need to remember our good fortune in that, however, however tough it is. Mm. And secondly, treat it like a job. You know, if all, if all of us were nurses or doctors, we wouldn't go, do you know, I don't feel like it today. Mm. So for me, regardless of how uncreative I feel, I'm here at this desk. And I start very early in the day, so I'm really here at this desk. You know, I start, <laughs> when I'm writing, I start about four because I work better in the very, very early morning. And it's a legacy from when I was writing around doing other jobs, you know, before I was a full-time writer. And it's just that, and because even I, I always turn up. And some days there will be nothing that, I'll, that is worth keeping, but I still was here. If you're not here, you, you can't be creative when inspiration comes. So it's making every possible, giving yourself every possible opportunity for when the moment strikes, you're at your desk. Yeah. And that's the only thing we can do, just keep going. And on the bad days, except, yeah, okay, it wasn't a great day. Not every day can be a great day. And honestly, I tot totally, totally agree. Especially when you're working in an agency and you're working with people. Yeah, you have to have the, you have to have the, the com not, it's not really confidence, but I genuinely believe nature doesn't like a vacuum. You have to get any idea down. You have to get your shit ideas out. You have to write them down. You have to share them. And for years, I would always kind of put my hand up in a group set and go, this might be shit, but, right? And then I could just get it out. And then that created room, for like Kate says, for the, for the good ideas to find. And you get to a point where, you know, if you, if you put it in, if you keep putting it in, you can even craft a shit idea up to an okay one and then still have one eye on inspiration because it is going to come. It always, it always finds you in the back, at your desk. It's funny you write at four, I write at six. <laughs> I do, I'm early morning. I'm early morning. Uh, and, you know, it's... Yeah, and that, that's the beauty of, of being a creative. And you're right. I always think nobody is standing clapping me at eight o'clock on a Thursday evening. You know, I am so lucky to be doing what I'm doing. Um, and, 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 we, you know, and a bad day at my level, you know, come on, nobody died. Yeah. We just thought of an idea. So I'll just go and hang out, God forbid, when we all get back together hang out with with people in my department and we'll just throw stuff around with no judgments and with that no, that no judgment um in mind and creating the space to sort of get your ideas out into the world a question that's come in for you vicky is do you think that the way we tell stories now is suffering from death by powerpoint <laughs> which is a great question by the way really good you know i no i don't i think the way the way advertising or kind of like the way that kind of communications work is we have to find a way of connecting with our customers by any means necessary mm. and you know and there's loads of barriers that are put in our way or seeming barriers that we put in our way like research everybody everybody's got a down run research until one of your ideas flies and then it's the best thing ever um you know if your powerpoint charts are killing an idea then make them as creative as you possibly can if that is a way that your client will buy an idea find another way mm. and you know you you have to be every single piece of our job is creative and that is the internal cell that is the external cell that is how we talk to people in research and then how we come out into the world and we have to find compelling truthful ways of talking to our consumers in their language um, and be invited into their into their spaces and places and homes and we've we've got in terms of the kind of the, the industry and the craft of creativity we've had some really interesting questions around you know who inspires you both like 
who do you who do you look up to which also ties into some of the questions we've had around resilience i think that's another quite overused word of 2020 i think it often uh, often used around women actually build resilience um which always gives me the mild rage um but what would you think about um who's keeping you creative and 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 who do you, do you look for for inspiration in order to get that sort of community sense that gives you that sense of resilience and well-being? It's a big question. <laughs> Sorry, I, I tried to tie up about six questions. No, no, you did that very. You did that very well. Um, well, firstly on resilience, I think you know they're separate, aren't they? Um, I think I'm glad that resilience is being talked about again. Actually, I'm an older generation of feminist and. Um, there's a lot of um, the sense of uh, we had about owning your own power, that not giving other people easily the chance to do you down and destroy you. Yeah. So this isn't about whether people should be sensitive or not or any of these things. It, you know, it's, it's a much bigger issue than that. But it was the idea that of my generation, it was it's up to you to try and keep yourself strong. What, however, that, you know, nowadays, I, the word that everybody would probably use is well-being. That was not a word that everybody would have fallen about laughing like the little spacemen on the smash advertisement, you know, if we'd use that word back in the 70s, and the, um, in the 80s. But I think I am glad to hear the word resilience being used because I think that we are, and particularly women, are encouraged too easily to give away our power over ourselves. If you let other people define um, how you feel and the world around you um, all the time. I mean, not, I, I obviously don't mean when something huge and appalling and big happens, but just on a general level, protect yourself with your own force field yeah. and mm -hmm. do all of those things, you know, about feeling strong and feeling good. We all wake up feeling rubbish. All of us have been awake half the night for eight months, haven't we? You know, everything in the middle of the night feels awful. It's all really terrible. But resilience is about going, do you know what? That, that's okay. The fact I feel bad today doesn't mean I'm going to feel bad tomorrow and human emotions go up and down and this idea that everything's got to be perfect all of the time and if it's not it's it's a bad thing that isn't what human experience is like so building resilience I think matters a great deal and I think it really matters for young women because I think a lot of opportunities um, are being taken away from a, a much younger generation than me at the moment because mm -hmm. the pandemic, nobody knows quite what the shape of things is going to be up. Unlike Vicky, um, uh -huh. I was like when it started, I, I'm always Pollyanna, I'm annoyingly, chirp, you know, my superpower is annoying chirpiness. Um, <laughs> but I absolutely thought it would be a year. Just mm -hmm. so I didn't feel as bad yeah, because yeah. I, I just thought like, okay, we're over halfway now, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so I, I mean, I'll let Fix talk about resilience because I'm sure she's got um, a lot of really important things to say on that before we talk about inspirations. But I think resilience is a good thing because it's about us owning our own power. Honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think we're kind of like, I think we're similar age where, you know, own, own your, you know, own your own story, own your own narrative, own your own path and and protect your own kind of like whether it be kind of like talent or creativity or own space then you know that's resilience for me mm. and not giving it away not letting it be chipped away not letting it be bullied away yeah not letting it be built by somebody else mm which is always used kind of like, you know, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a bully. I'm just building resilience in them. Oh. Mm. Yeah. So it is all about kind of like preservation is the wrong word because you need to grow and you need to nurture, but just finding, you know, the thing that unlocked it for me was finding people like-minded outsiders, if you like. Yeah. That would gravitate in pockets of agencies. Yeah. Um, and do their own thing and find their own space and kind of look after each other and that was kind of important to me but but you know i would i've got this awful thing and it makes i'm sure people think i'm really rude when i go into meetings but i won't pour anybody a coffee i yeah. won't be mother 
It's just yeah. my little thing. I won't be mother. You know, I'm gagging for one. But <laughs> I just, you know, as soon as I start, oh, should I be mother? And then suddenly you've just lost. Then, you know, people, people yeah. are paying you. I don't, you know, people are paying you good money to be in that room and have, they are paying for your opinion and, and you know, and your talent and your craft. I'm, you know, and then I can, de I can like undermine that really easily just by saying, oh, do you, you know, I'll be mother. Um, so I, you will have had the same as me, Vix. You will quite often in your early career, um, you and I will have been the only woman in the room. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah, so yeah. if you then behave like the assistant, it's not that it's wrong being an assistant because we've all been that too. Yeah. But it, it's, it, that is a kind of, forgive me for the phrase, a one-upmanship yeah. that sounds terribly petty, but it is part of defining your own path. And a lot of those things, when I talk to my children who are 30 and 28 about some of these things, they go, oh, mum, I can't believe people did that. And you go, well, many things have changed brilliantly for the better. Exactly. Naturally, yeah. Women being there creatively as equal players, not as the assistant to the person who has been creative. Exactly. It's really important to protect that because things go backwards as well as forwards, you know. I think that's yeah. such an important point. And I, I love the fact that what you're talking about it is kind of it's it's different building resilience in yourself yeah. rather than building a resilience to put up with misogyny as yeah. opposed to going actually no that's not going to happen yeah. and it actually really draws into some of the questions we've had around the need to tell new stories without stereotypes um, and the and the role of, of female creatives in doing that um, but I'm really conscious we we are really running out of time um, and this has been such a wonderful conversation and I'm so grateful to you both but I just wanted to close by asking you both to leave our audience with a bit of a top tip to do list because it's you know it's November the nights are getting dark you know I'm really here for this um, done is better than perfect uh, way for doing things so Vicky could you could you um, kick off with some top tips for, for staying creative and, and storytelling for the audience? I just, I just kind of, I put, my, I put my top tips down, they kind of work for me, but the first one is get your shit ideas out. That whole thing about nature doesn't, doesn't like a vacuum. You know, if you're, if you're kind of freaked out by a blank sheet of paper or a blank screen, scribble on it, doodle on it, just put anything down and just keep going. And then for me, it's all about making connections with, with the audience I'm talking to. Yeah. And I, so I stalk my audience. Yeah. If you don't know them, you can't talk to them. And if you can like them even better. So I will never turn a, I will never turn a brief down because it doesn't look like a brief for me. Mm. So if I'm doing a gaming brief, even though I've got knickers older than the majority of the audience that I'm talking to, I, you know, I'm on Twitch. I'm looking at how they speak. I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm creepily stalking them and finding ways of making a connection with them. And I think that that is really, really important for me. Um, you know, and, it's, uh, and then that kind of like, get out of my bubble. But, and this is the one thing that lockdown has really shook me out of. I have go-tos, like I said, I'm writing copy bars. You know, I used to be six o'clock in the morning. I used to be down the meat market in a cafe writing at the back of, you know, because their cafes are open 24 hours. I'd find my little spot and I would do two hours, three hours before I'd go into work. All of that has been taken away from me now. Yeah. And I'm very, very cognizant of that. And so I'm finding new ways to kind of feed that. And it's so funny, Kate that you've been talking about, but I've, I've turned into an urban bird watcher. Yeah. I'm by, I live by Victoria Park. Two years ago, I would have gladly concreted the lot, right? And now I'm like, oh my God, I've heard there's a woodpecker. It's, it's ridiculous. So, so I've, I'm out of my bubble. And then for me, find your voice, but then ignore her or him. For me, if, if I... I know, I, I kind of know how to write now. I think I know how to connect. But if it looks like me talking to an audience, then I've got it wrong. So the worst thing, I, I did a piece of work of, of, a few months back 
and a couple of people came up to me, oh my God, I could totally see you in that piece of work. I was gutted mm. because it's not about me. Mm. Yeah, I was like, oh, and I, I'm, I'm proud that Havas this year hasn't got a house style mm. because every piece of work should be true to the brand and the audience and I, and I should be able to take myself out. And then finally, everyone has shit days. Mm. Yeah, just, just know that tomorrow you'll wake up in a totally different space, but don't, like Kate says, don't move away from the desk. This is a job, see it through. Don't walk away from it. And I, for one, I'm gonna go under my bed, pick out all of those first chapters, have a read through, and I'm gonna bloody well finish one if it kills me. I'm so here for that advice. Um, I think seeing it through is such a powerful message um, as we come to the end of this year. And Kate, what, what advice can you share? Well, firstly, listen to Vix. And Vix, <laughs> when, um, when this is over, my love, I'm, I'm gonna be up in, um, in the Havas office. I should come and find you and take you out for a drink. Amazing, so, love it. So, I mean, mo a lot of it we kind of talked about and I, uh, and I think Vix and I kind of have similar bits of advice, but um, just additional ones, trust your instinct. Um, I think it's really, really important that we respect all creatives. I don't, you know, I think we respect the people who create the brilliant ads, the people who create the brilliant pieces of dance, the people who create the brilliant paintings, the people who create the brilliant novels, and also all the people who try to do all of those things. So just always remember to respect creatives um, because it's hard to put yourself out there and it's horrible when people just go, ah, that's rubbish, you know, when someone's put their heart and soul into it. But trust your instinct. And we all know what we mean. Every now and again, there'll be a great scandal. You know, some T-shirt design will come out and it will be so inappropriate. And the whole world will go, why did nobody say that this was not a suitable for a four-year-old girl? And you know that there will have been lots of people who thought but didn't say. So trust your instinct. I think that's really important creatively. Vix has already said, get it down. If you haven't got anything, you've got nothing to work with. Um, for me, the opposite to Vix, listen to the silence. I, I'm <laughs> the other way around. I think that we need to find room for silence in our lives. Um, I'm not a person who walks listening to podcasts. When I walk, I walk and I'm in my head and the world that I'm in. So being grounded in the actual place, I think for a lot of creative people, sometimes you can only stress test an idea in the silence you know when you're le left alone with it face to face and allied to that is give yourself time to reconsider so i am a l always even though my books are enormous i am a essay crisis mm -hmm. girl every single thing i do is about to be late um without fail you know i i leave it until the fear is what helps me find the real creative thing that i need but giving yourself time to reconsider. So actually, was that a great idea or are you just really pleased because you finished it? And you know, so that I think is try and manage your time from that. And the final one, which I, I think, you know, is the most important thing for all of us who are creative people, whatever form that takes, be proud. Be yeah. proud yeah. of what you've achieved because sometimes you'll publish a book and you think it's the best book you've ever written and it won't be number one in the charts and it won't sell very well and nobody likes it and you get terrible reviews. And other times you've written a book that you thought was okay and then that's the one that's number one and everybody gets brilliant reviews. But the point is what happens to your piece of work once it's left you is out of your control. Mm -hmm. But what you are in control of is being proud of the piece of work. So draw a line under that and separate the creation from the delivery and the reception of the creation because that way you don't go mad. Because otherwise, we again, it's about handing our power over and then we end up devastated that nobody liked it as much as we did. But if you manage to protect your own creativity and separate it from its reception, then it won't, it won't make it less painful, but it will make it less painful for a shorter amount of time. Um, and I think that is my final word on the matter. I think that's such a good final word for 2020. I think it's, you know, definitely, I think it's so amazing that people are still getting work out into the world and being creative in whatever the way they can be this year. I think 
top of the list is like well done for getting it done <laughs> and, that's, and that's definitely um, a mantra and I think we'll all be searching on our under our metaphorical mattresses Vicky to get out those creative ideas that we've uh, maybe not been brave enough to get out into the world so thank you both um, for taking the time for such a really interesting um, and inspiring session and thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in today and and given your lunch break to to us we massively appreciate that and thank you so much to have us again um whose support has made this session free and accessible to everyone and also to the incredible faye raincock who's worked tirelessly behind the scenes making this all happen so thank you so much you've given us so much inspiration um, and we will be sharing this all um, after the event as well, all those top tips. So thanks so much um, and thank you everyone and have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Nikki. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone. Thanks.